Good evening, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, don't forget, homework eight is due this Wednesday, December 2nd, and lab two is due Monday, December 7th. And so what I will be doing is posting um, review problems for the final exam. There's also, take a look at the practice problems. They're out there right now uh, for the for the, some of the material that we've covered since exam two. I will also post uh, exam-like problems on Canvas, and we'll talk about those during uh, the, the review coming up after we finish up the, the class material. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, also, if, if you haven't noticed already on Slack, if you need help on Slack, I cannot add you uh, automatically to the channel. So you have to search out the channels yourself, uh, for example, for Lab 10, in order to, uh, to, to join that channel. I'm unable to add you automatically. Okay, let's see what else. That's all I have for today. If you have any questions during class, uh, be sure to unmute. Um, or, or shoot me a chat, and then if I don't see the chat, uh, definitely unmute. Otherwise, please stay muted to keep the, the background noise low. So up on the screen now, I have the course roadmap. So we're really, we're really coming up to the last, uh, last few topics uh, of, of the course. We just covered uh, moto, m motors, motors and servo motors, servo mechanisms. And today we're going to move on uh, to sensors. Now you've been working a little bit with uh, light sensors with your uh, last lab using a photo transistor. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, another light sensor today. So let me bring up some other slides here to get started with electronic sensors. So what I wanna do is I want to uh, introduce uh, elect electrical transducers and also circuits that support uh, electronic sensors, transducers in order to give a useful output that, that you might uh, encounter in the future. So let's get started by talking about electrical transducers. So what is a transducer? An electrical transducer converts a physical quantity into an electrical quantity. So uh, if this box here is a transducer, you'd have some kind of physical input um, that would act on the transducer. And then you would have some sort of electrical output. For example, uh, heat, uh, light, uh, force, pressure, motion, acceleration, some kind of physical input like this. And of course, you know, you could, derive acceleration from force. Um, these are not uh, independent uh, orthogonal physical inputs. You could think there's many ways to, to sense something, but these are just examples of what the physical input to a transducer might be. And the electrical output would be voltage or current, or maybe power, but usually voltage or, or current is, is uh, the output of a transducer. So for practical examples, uh, thermistors and thermocouples. So a thermistor is a resistor with a really bad temperature tolerance <laughs> intentionally. A thermistor is uh, a resistor whose resistance varies with temperature so that you can, you can uh, for example, put a thermistor in a voltage divider circuit and measure the output voltage and calibrate that output voltage of the, the voltage divider, uh, calibrate it to temperature. Uh, thermocouples are another type of temperature sensor. Thermocouples actually generate a, uh, a voltage, a very small voltage, and you usually need a specialized amplifier at the output of a thermocouple in order to uh, make the output useful. And we'll talk about that output circuit in a minute or a similar one. Um, <clears throat> Phototransistors. Uh, you've worked with phototransistors in your project. So phototransistors uh, uh, have a window into their base and when light hits the base, that controls the collector current. We're going to talk about photodiodes today uh, for, uh, as a sensor for light sensing. 
um, so we'll get more into detail, but photodiodes are a passive component that um, control uh, either uh, an output voltage or an output current, and we'll talk about that. Uh, strain gauges and load cells are also transducers, so strain gauge essentially measures uh, deformation, so it's really a, a resistor um, sometimes printed on a material, and when that material bends or stretches, that deforms the resistor material, and you get a very small resistance change. And you can uh, you can sense that small resistance change, generate a voltage, and use that to measure uh, deformation or force or weight or pressure. Um, strain gauges are usually built up into uh, load cells. So if you have an electronic scale at home, uh, if you look at the uh, if it's just a cheap scale off of uh, you know Amazon Target, uh, e under each of the feet, between each of the feet and the, and the scale base um, is is a load cell, and uh, it has this kind of uh, strain gauge configuration built into it. Um, so other kinds of sensors, uh, piezo sensor um, and microphones, so they can measure or sense vibration uh, and vibration at audio frequencies too. So these are examples of uh, transducers that would be built into a larger sensor circuit to measure some kind of physical input and give you an electrical output. In fact, I've, I was just uh, speaking uh, with the instructor of the data analysis course that uh, many of you uh, might be taking next semester. And so you're going to get some experience with uh, measuring physical inputs, probably temperature, using your analog discovery to, uh, in order to do some data collection and do some analysis on physical quantities. But how do you measure these physical quantities? With a transducer, and you actually log an electrical output that you have to calibrate to the physical input. So you're actually going to see this uh, next semester if you take uh, your data analysis course. Uh, so the transducer itself is a useful device, but on its own, sometimes it's not so useful. You take a physical input, you apply it to a transducer, and oftentimes you get what I call a not so useful output. It's often too small of a value. If it's a voltage that changes, it might only change by a couple millivolts, um, which is hard to measure, and hard to apply in a system. You might get a very small change of resistance, uh, which is, again, hard to measure. So what is useful, or to get a useful electrical output, uh, typically you would have a transducer interface circuit. Okay, it, what's that mean? It means just some circuit that supports the transducer to produce a useful electrical output. Well, what is useful? Uh, if you have, for example, a, um, you know, a light detector, maybe a, a temperature sensor that outputs a range of voltage that is a, a few volts, right? Maybe three volts, maybe five volts, sp spanning over maybe zero to, you know, zero to three volts, zero to five volts. That's a kind of voltage range that can be measured by a microcontroller or a data acquisition device like your AD2. Uh, again, you'll probably see this next semester. Um, but if you try to use the AD2 to measure really small voltages, you know, down into the, kind of the microamp level or microvolt level, it's going to be a really noisy, um, not accurate output and, until you add some kind of uh, transducer interface circuit to it. And we're going to go through an example today, and I'll show you some actual experimental results. So the typical function of uh, functions of an interface circuit would, would be these uh, gain. So we've talked about gain. Gain is really a voltage multiplication. It can also be a current multiplication. We'll talk about that today too. Uh, another function might be addition or subtraction. <clears throat> so why would you want to do that? Well, um, if you have 
if you have a, a, a transducer that has an inherent bias, it has a, an offset, a DC offset, you may not care about the DC offset, you just want to look at the, the changes of the output. Well, you can use a circuit, think op amp, that can add or subtract uh, a constant value, a DC value, so you can take away, take off that offset and measure just the, the, the changing value. You might want to take the uh, derivative or the integral, right, of of a sensor. Uh, derivative. Think think if you're if you're measuring, um, oh, I don't know, speed. You might want to take the derivative of uh, of a, a you know a distance measurement to measure speed. Um, if you're trying to measure, I don't know, distance, and you have a speed sensor, you you might want to uh, take an integral. You can also do that with op amps. Um, sometimes it makes sense to do that uh, in the analog domain with op amps, and sometimes it makes sense to do that in, in software. But if you need to uh, condition the output of the transducer, right, this output of the transducer, if it's so small, not useful, you need to condition uh, uh, that output anyway to produce a useful output, then you could build one or more of these functions into that circuit. And that's where op amps really come in uh, as very useful devices. Okay, so um, what I want to do is I'd like to show you an example electrical transducer. So let's move over to the whiteboard. So here's the same diagram I I, uh, I have uh, I had earlier. You have a, a you know physical input and some electrical output that's again probably not useful directly. We're going to work on looking at an example transducer and then a circuit that makes the output useful. So let's talk about uh, photodiodes. So photodiodes, in generally, they, they generate a current as a function of light. Okay, so that's that's their function, and it's actually the light that strikes their their active area. So there's a uh, it's a diode. It has a window to its active area, actually its depletion region, and uh, it, it generates a current um, that is uh, a function of the intensity of light impinging on that active area. Um, it's a diode, so you can just draw this as a diode. Um, you can define uh, a voltage across that diode, just like we have in the past, a current into that diode, just, just like we have in, in the past. Um, I'm going to add a couple arrows here. These arrows indicate that uh, light is impinging on, oh, my camera dropped, that light is impinging on that diode. Okay, so if you see arrows coming into a diode, it usually means it's some sort of photodiode or photodetector. If you see arrows going out of a diode, it's, it's a light emitting diode, typically. Okay, so what's special about this diode? Let's draw, as we usually do, a voltage and current plot. Okay, so I'm going to label this uh, diode voltage on the horizontal axis and diode current on the vertical axis. So in, in the dark, uh, this diode, just this photodiode just behaves like a diode. Uh, for negative VD values, you get almost no current. And then you get this sharp knee uh, 
at some value like a you know a forward voltage value. That's what we called it before. So this is this is the diode in the dark. This is called the dark current curve. Dark current. That says dark current. My pen's getting thick here. So curve. Um, something really interesting happens when you expose the active area uh, to light. When when the active area or the depletion region is illuminated, photons uh, cause a an electron hole pair to happen, and it actually shifts this curve down to the lower right. So it looks something like this. Let's try to try to duplicate this curve here like that. So what I'm illustrating is this shift of a curve due to light. Okay, so this is when light absorbed. Okay, so um, let's, so this is the, the red curve is the diode in light. Uh, let's talk about two conditions for this diode. Let's suppose that the diode is just left um, open, open circuited. So in other words, I have the diode sitting here like this, right here's, hmm. Drop me again. Zoom is not liking me today. So you have this diode just, just, just sitting here, and you expose this diode to light. It's not connected to anything. Okay, so that means that no current is flowing. So if I look at this plot where no current is flowing, I'm right there on the plot, right? So I'm actually producing a voltage. I'm creating a voltage because of that light. And so if I were to take a, a voltmeter on this diode, right? So I just connect the voltmeter. Right, maybe with this polarity, I would measure the diode voltage greater than zero. Okay, so expose light, I get a positive voltage that matches this plot right here. So that's one way you could actually uh, sense light impinging on this diode is that you get a shift in this curve and that voltage shifts a little bit. Okay, there's another way, and that's if you take a diode, this photodiode, so this photodiode here. And then I essentially short its uh, anode to its cathode. Okay, it's like I connect a wire from an a the anode to the cathode, except I'm going to do that through an ammeter. Call that an ammeter. All right, so I just shorted that diode through an ammeter. And what I want to measure is this ID value here. So my ammeter would be oriented with its terminals like that. So uh, if you look at this curve, again, this diode is exposed to light. Let me draw my light arrows there. The diode's exposed uh, to light. I have zero voltage because again, I'm shorting anode to cathode. VD is zero, so I actually 
get a measurable, uh, an actual current flow, but it's negative. I mean, isn't that weird? So it sure looks like I have current, and I do have current going backwards through a diode, but that's because I'm not using the diode in the traditional sense of this one-way valve, one valve where I have an external voltage applied and, I have, and I'm measuring an external current. The light is actually causing uh, this electron hole pair, and it's causing positive charge to flow. You know, from the outside of this diode, it's positive charge to flow uh, in, in the opposite direction from, from the anode externally right, to, to the cathode over here. So ID as seen through the diode uh, is, is actually negative, okay? This is a really small value. So uh, this is, uh, let me back up. The use of current from a photodiode to detect light is common. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to make it a useful value because this diode uh, current, when it's exposed to light, is a few microamps, microamps, like one, two, three, four microamps. That's pretty hard to measure. Um, not too many uh, ammeters accurately measure microamps unless they have some special circuit built in. Um, so. So you really, this, this is where I get back to this electrical output of this transducer is not directly all that useful. So what we're going to do next is we're going to create a circuit using an op amp to turn this few microamps into a useful value. Okay. All right. Um, professor? Yes. So then when we're not accounting for um, light absorbed, like if we are looking at the dark current curve, it's just the same as any other diode like curve we've looked at? That's right. In, in the dark, this diode just looks like a, um, it, it, it just looks like a regular diode. It behaves like a regular diode. It has some forward voltage. It has um, a reverse bias region where very little current flows in the dark. And then on the forward bias side, you get this knee in the curve. So yeah, it just looks like a diode. And then when you expose it to light, it produces voltage and current. Okay, thank you. Now what's interesting here is, okay, well, here, here's where you're producing current. Okay, you're producing current there. Well, what about, uh, in the middle here. Well, <clears throat> first let's look at these endpoints again. When I'm producing um, voltage at this dot, my current is zero, so the power is zero, right? V times I. When I'm producing current down here, uh, the voltage is zero, so the power delivered is zero, right? V times I. Well, in the middle here, actually, this is where you're producing power because V and I are non-zero. So this is the mode along this photodiode where you would use it to produce power, and that's what a solar panel is. So this is the method that solar panels use to produce, uh, produce power is you're not shorting. You're not, you don't have the uh, terminal shorted. You don't have the terminals open. You have something in between, and the light is causing um, power to be produced. So you're taking optical energy, converting it to electrical energy. Okay, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna concentrate on using a photodiode as a, a sensor. So I wanna concentrate on producing current. So then what is different like about these diodes? Why did these diodes have this different curve when exposed to light as opposed to any other diode? Well, the other diodes, their their region isn't exposed to to light, so and they're not the same materials as a as a silicon diode. They're more like an LED than they are a, a plain old silicon diode. So these diodes have the characteristic again, just like an LED. In fact, I'm going to show you. You can use an LED as a photodiode. I'll show you that. But 
they have their um, their active region, their depletion region exposed through a window to light, so that photons can uh, can hit that region and uh, produce voltage and current. Okay, so so, so regular like if diodes were really okay. handy. You could make any diode into a photodiode. No, there's it's no, it's just uh, because you have to um, have the diode able to create photons from its active region, and you do that using the materials, uh, the semiconductor materials and the doping materials in order to do that, to either produce the right wavelength for uh, LEDs or to absorb certain wavelengths and produce voltage and current like in photodiodes. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, in fact, I'd encourage you, it's really fascinating stuff to go look into semiconductor physics and uh, the materials used in semiconductors. Um, we're not going to dig into that here, but it's it's really uh, fascinating. You'll you will you will recall some of your physics lessons uh, if if you dig into uh, the way diodes operate, um, especially LEDs and photodiodes. Um, professor. Yes. So you were saying that um, when the photodiode's producing current, that's when we can use it as part of a sensor, but that's uh, when we need the transducer interface circuit, right? Because you said the current's really small. That's right. This is just a few microamps. Um, now you can use you can use the voltage uh, production as a sensor too. It's typically not because that's usually a uh, considered a noisier um, a noisier value compared to when you are using the current okay. uh, as the sensor output. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's go to an example. I'm just going to throw this uh, printed slide on the board here. You can see it. Okay, so um, let's see. So, so this uh, this is an example. Let's suppose you have the photodiode as the transducer, and you have a few microamps at the output. Again, that's really small; it's hard to measure even with an ammeter. What we're going to use is we're going to build the circuit, design the circuit that takes this few microamps and converts it into a few volts. Now, you know you could measure, you know, the range of zero to three volts very easily with your um, with your AD2, and you'll see next semester how you can acquire that uh, voltage over time as, as data. We're going to use, we're going to design an amplifier called a trans impedance amplifier. So, trans impedance amplifier uh, does this, and I'll explain a little more while we're designing it. But instead of amplifying voltage and creating another voltage, it amplifies current, you know, amplifies current at the input and you get a voltage at the output. So this is like a current controlled voltage source, right? So if you, voltage at the output, current doing the controlling at the input. So here's the example application. Let's suppose you want to do some pulse width modulation light detection. Let's suppose you have something, you have a light and you're looking at the light and it's flashing so fast you can't, you don't know its frequency, you don't know its duty cycle, but, but you would like to detect that. That's the application. So a certain photodiode um, produces three microamps into a short circuit during peak illumination. Okay, so that's what you have to work with. Um, so when it's when this diode is at its peak illumination from a pulse width modulated light source, you would see a peak of three microamps. Let's design a circuit that outputs three volts during peak illumination, okay? And the output voltage should increase with higher peak illumination. So you get the, you get the light source closer or um, you get it brighter in some way, the peak illumination brighter, the voltage should increase. So that's what we wanna do. That's, that's the design problem here. So let's do that.
So I would, I would claim once you have the template for this, uh, the circuit, you, you could design it yourself at this point. I'm going to walk you through it, but there's no reason you couldn't do this um, yourself now. So we have this diode. Let's let's draw out again its voltage and current characteristic. This is VD. This is ID. And for a certain illumination, it does this. Right? Something like that's a little less sloped than that. And right here, right at that point, VD equals zero volts and ID equals minus three microamps. Okay, so that's what we're working with. So we need a circuit that, that does something with this diodes current. So we're going to build a trans impedance amplifier. It's just a name given to an op amp circuit that converts a small current to a big voltage. Okay, it outputs a voltage proportional to current. Let's do a block diagram of this. Let's draw something here. So this is my trans impedance amp in this block. Let's put an input on the left. Let's give it a ground also. Let's put its output on the right. So the input is current. I in, and the output is voltage, V out. Okay, and just everything's referenced to ground here. That's why I have the, the ground. So you could even draw a terminal here. So I in would go in, and it's going to some, somehow make it down to ground through this circuit. OK, uh, let's, let's talk about characterizing this. You know, we had. When we talked about voltage amplifiers, we defined this value called AV, the voltage gain. It was, it was V out over V in. So instead of a voltage gain, we're gonna have what's called a trans impedance gain. It's a long word for a simple concept. And we're gonna give it the variable R, that's a lowercase r right there. I'll show you, you'll, you'll see why in a second, it's R, because it is the output voltage divided by the input current, right? So it's the ratio of V out over I in. So V out is a bigger value, I in is a really small value, so R is a fairly big value. It's called R because uh, it's V over I, right? That looks a lot like a resistance, right? And that's why this is called a trans impedance amplifier because V over I in general, right, for AC signals is, a, uh, is an impedance. Right here, we're assuming it's real, so it's a resistance. Um, so V over I is, 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 is an impedance or a resistance. Well, why is it a trans impedance gain or a trans impedance amplifier? Well, that's because voltage and current are happening at different places. So the V is over here on the right, the I is on, on the uh, left. And so this trans impedance gain characterizes the transfer function from input to the output to the output. And that's what this is. So R, this variable R is the trans impedance gain. It's what characterizes a trans impedance amplifier, just like voltage gain characterizes a, a voltage amplifier. Okay. so. So let's do this. Let's create uh, a circuit that will do this. Let's do it using an op amp.
Okay, so that's all you need. You power that op amp, right? When you don't see the power supplies connected to an op amp, you, you assume it's sufficiently powered. And so this op amp is, is powered with VCC and VEE. Um, for, for analysis purposes, let me, let me just, let's just draw in explicitly a current source here that represents I in, because we know that current's coming from somewhere. It's coming from a photodiode, but let's assume it's just some current source now. And then V out uh, is a voltage with respect to ground like this, right? It's a node voltage between that output node and ground. Okay, um, so this is just like a, you know, a circuit you would analyze for a homework problem, except it's a really useful circuit. Uh, some homework problems actually are useful. Um, so let's go back to the rules, the steps for analyzing an op amp circuit. You ask yourself, does this circuit have negative feedback? I claim it does because there's some connection between the output and the inverting input. So we have negative feedback. Since we have negative feedback, we can assume that the input differential voltage is zero volts right, between the op amp inputs. And in fact, we can always assume the op amp has zero amps going into its inputs. Okay, so now we start picking apart this problem, just start defining what we know. Well, I have some value. So what am I trying to find? I'm trying to find, I'm, I'm trying to find V out equals something times I in, right? So I'm trying to find some equation. I'll write it down here. V out equals something times I in, right? That's the kind of equation I'm trying to find here. Okay, so let's just start writing things in. Zero amps goes into the op amp. Uh, I in comes into this left node, so that means that I in must continue on this way, right, through that feedback resistor. By Ohm's law, I would know the voltage uh, across that feedback resistor there. And I think at this point, that's all I can tell right now. I have to figure out some equation, some analysis that lets me do a loop or a, a node equation uh, that, that gives me, well, V out equals something times I in. Well, let's try this. I think that if I connect these, again, you can connect all these grounds together, right? They're all the same potential. So add the wire if it helps visualize. I think I can write a KVL equation. Oh, let's let's start here and go this way. So let's see. Plus zero plus I in times RF plus V out equals zero. I think that's going to give me what I want. So let's see, plus zero plus I in RF right, plus V out equals zero. So there, there's my there's my equation here, uh, V out equals minus RF. All right, I'll put this in parentheses here, times I in. So there's my uh, transimpedance gain right there, right? V out is equal to R times I in. So the transimpedance gain is equal to minus RF. All right. Okay, let's, so now that we have this textbook circuit uh, with a current source, let's actually draw in the, uh, the photodiode. Now, what I would like is I would like, if you, uh, you know, back at the problem statement, I wanted um, three volts at the output when I had peak illumination. So three volts at the output. Notice the transimpedance gain is negative RF, right? So negative RF times I in is, uh, is what I'm looking at here. So, so I think, so I'm gonna have to be careful when I orient this diode. I think I want a negative current into the input 
in order to get a positive voltage at the output, right? Because I, negative current I in times the negative value is positive V out. So let's, let's do this. Uh, let me redraw the circuit a bit. And so I know that my ID is a negative value when I expose the diode to light. So let's try this. So I know that this is ID, right? This is ID here. It's the photodiode. So that value, this is what we called I in, right? That value is going to be negative, right? Negative when I expose this diode to light. And so I have I in equals negative three microamps that was given, all right, data sheet or maybe measured. You V out what I want when I in is negative three microamps, I want three volts, okay? So I can figure out what uh, transimpedance gain I want. I want V out three volts divided by, uh, minus three times 10 to the negative sixth amps, right? This is V out over I in here. And so that means I want R equal to minus 10 to the sixth. That's what I want my transimpedance scan. If you really want units on that, right? It's gonna be, uh, you know, volts per amp. Okay, well that's interesting. And, and now, so now we know also that R is equal to minus RF. So RF equals minus R equals 10 to the sixth ohms equals one mega ohm. All right. Okay, so if I, if I set RF to one mega ohm, I power up an op amp, I make these connections, I take this photodiode, I insert it here, orient it as shown. Then I have a light sensor that produces three volts at the output when this diode is exposed to light and producing three microamps. Okay, any questions on that? I'll show you a measured example. I actually built this up and I'll show you the measured example. But any questions before I move to that? Um, professor? Yes. Is that like, um certain conditions that a photodiode has to be at where you would have zero volts and that specific negative current that you see in the current voltage um, plot? Yeah, it's a certain light intensity. So you could see what, what light intensity, and it's usually a relative value, but what light intensity would produce uh, three microamps. This was actually from a test. I, I looked at a data sheet, it gave a relative plot, and I did a test and determined it was three microamps. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, let me share something here. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, and I think you got a question in the chat. Oh, thanks. Let's see here. Okay, do photoresistors and photodiodes work using the photoelectric property? So um, the answer is yes. Um, so that the, when a photon hits the active region and causes the um, splitting of the, the hole in electron, that is, that is caused by the photoelectric effect. Yes, that's right. Okay, so here's what I did. I, I, was, I was curious um, how this headlamp uh, dimmed. And uh, this, this is just a hiking headlamp. You should see it on the screen kind of over here. Make sure my arrow is up here. 
So it's a headlamp. And what and I didn't have I didn't have a photo diode on hand. So what I did is I tested an LED because LEDs will work like well a good a reasonable substitute for a photo diode. Uh, they work in in uh, in a reciprocal function too, right? Taking light in and producing uh, voltage, just like they work to produce light. It's not a very good photo diode, but it it worked well enough for this experiment. So so you'd be able to do this. I encourage you. In fact, uh, you you have all the lab equipment now and all the parts in your kit where you could try this experiment yourself and you could check uh, flashing of lights. Um, you know, maybe uh, fluorescent lights and LED lights and, and, you know, different lights around your house. And you could actually uh, measure these results yourself for, for different lights and build up the circuit yourself. But I was curious about this headlamp. So what I did is at the bottom here, um, I used this other kind of op amp, but just as a general purpose op amp. And this is just the green LED at the, the lower left here. And here's the op amp. I powered it. You can see the power here applied. I've got my decoupling capacitor. Remember, that's for good measure. And this brown, black, green resistor, this is a one meg ohm resistor. So that is setting my transimpedance gain of this amplifier. Okay, so again, right down here, this is the schematic. Okay, so I turned this headlamp on, just one click, and I measured it. And so, I, you know, I looked at this. And I thought that was interesting. I'm seeing this square wave, uh, and I expected it would be pulse width modulation. But when you turn the headlamp on for the first time, well, it's not full power. It's not full brightness. Well, apparently it's not, because I don't get 100% duty cycle. So what I see here is a 490 uh, hertz square wave, and I think duty cycle, yeah, about a 66% duty cycle. So hey, that that was neat to see. You know, let me uh, let me adjust dimming. But but notice here that this LED working as a photodiode and this op amp, it's fast enough to catch these nice square transitions, right? Its slew rate is high enough compared to the um, frequency and the transition time, rise time, fall time of of that light. So I'm actually seeing really interesting results here. So what I did is I uh, I dimmed the headlamp a bit. And as you would expect, the duty cycle falls. The frequency stays about the same at about 490 hertz, and the duty cycle falls, and the, the LED headlamp gets a little dimmer, make it a little dimmer. Again, you see smaller duty cycle, same frequency. Again, implementing just what we, what we talked about in, in class and what you experimented with in lab. And finally, I think this was the dimmest setting I could, I could get to, and I got down to what a 2% duty cycle, really dim light, but yet the same frequency, this 490 hertz, right? Um, and then I, I uh, you know, went to full brightness, and at full brightness, 100% duty cycle, and so the headlamp doesn't turn on at full brightness. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, but, but like I said, you can you can build this. It's pretty interesting to sense lights around your house. If you, you, know, you might want to test a fluorescent light or a, uh, another LED light, maybe an LED light bulb, right? Um, test an incandescent light, see what it, see what it looks like. Uh, but this is a way, so the, the point of this is this, that the photodiode, in this case LED as a substitute, produces a very small current uh, based on the light intensity uh, that, that it receives. That that current is really small. If you try to measure that with uh, maybe an, an ammeter, like a multimeter that you have at home, uh, you're not gonna see much. You, it's gonna be hard to tell if the light is on or off or bright or dark. But if you build this amplifier, this transducer interface circuit, uh, it's easy to produce a, uh, a gain of 10 to the sixth and actually amplify that current to produce a voltage that is very measurable. In this case, it's a three volt, three volt value. And so, um, and I think you're gonna run into this in the future when you, when you uh, do well your data analysis class or even in any product development or research that you're doing where you have to detect light, heat, force, weight, uh, pressure, 
right? Where you're going to have a transducer. And so what I'd like to, I'd like to have come out of this is, you know, come to my, should come to your mind, huh? I need to amplify this unuseful value to something. And I can do that, right? You can do that with op amps. Um, you can take an op amp, you can, you can amplify up a current, you can amp amplify up a voltage and uh, actually get measurable, useful results out of your test. Okay, so I have run out of time for this class. Um, don't forget, homework eight is due on Wednesday. Lab 10 is due next Monday. So thanks for joining class. Um, I do appreciate your attendance. I'm, I'm glad you're joining. I hope it's working out well. And for the last few classes, let me know if anything isn't, and I'm happy to try to fix it. Um, I will start office hours in just a minute. If I see you there, great. If not, I will see you next time. Have a good night.